I'm Ryan Yamamoto. This is the Minute. San Francisco Police are investigating a deadly shooting after the discovery of two bodies inside a home. This was a scene on the White Street in the Portola District last night. No word yet on who the people are or what led up to that shooting. Boeing CEO says he's stepping down by the end of the year. The departure of Dave Calhoun comes after nearly five years in that role. Calhoun and the company are facing mounting pressure to make changes after a series of safety incidents in recent months. And Daly City Seton Hospital workers are on a two-day strike. They are calling for better health benefits amid ongoing contract negotiations. Seton Hospital says they're disappointed with the union's decision. Their priority is to provide uninterrupted care to their patients. The Bay Area's only primetime newscast at 8 and 9 p.m. on the all-new Pix Plus 44 Cable 12. I'm Ryan Yamamoto. This is The Minute. Okay, the next couple of days are pretty easy. We're waiting for the next system on Wednesday to come from a thousand miles out that way and bring us a chance of rain. We can see it here on the future cast. That system rolls in for the second half of Wednesday. This is the one we started timing out a little bit earlier in a previous visit, just to show you what this looks like. It's a few scattered showers through Wednesday afternoon and evening, maybe a quarter of an inch of rain. So not a super rainy scenario here. We're not worried about flooding or any major impacts from this one, but we got to put rain in the seven day forecast because of it. It's about a quarter of an inch of rain. The one that comes in after that on Friday has better ingredients. It's put together in a more impressive way and it's going to mean better rain most likely on Friday, maybe a half an inch of rain. It's a little too early to get too specific on this one though, because as you'll see, this system becomes a cutoff low. One of those that detaches itself from the storm track and then has nothing to motivate it to move along and it just sits out here and wanders and wobbles seemingly aimlessly. And by the time we get to the weekend, it's drifted back out off the coast and we may very well find ourselves in a break as we go into Saturday and Sunday where we're not getting rained on. But that is too close for comfort as these cutoff lows are notorious for changing the details until we get within about three days. So we're still outside the window where we can really nail these things down with much certainty. That's why the weekend forecast is one to stay on top of with us. And we're going to keep updating you as we get closer on the details. Here's one possible scenario. What's the total amount of rainfall look like from Wednesday through Saturday? As we take the whole using the best long range model. It's done the best over the course of the winter with these adds up to about an inch in general, maybe an inch and a half in the North Bay, an inch or so southward. For a four day period, that's totally manageable. So again, we're not too concerned about this. It's like a significant rain event. We're not talking about any flooding concerns, but it is going to be widespread rain. And it'll certainly be good snow in the Sierra should this come together this way. Much more to go on this one as we get closer to it. Let's put it into the seven day forecast. Uh, Wednesday is the day where we've got the highest degree of certainty on here. That's where we pick up about a quarter of an inch of rain through the second half of the day. Thursday is the in between day, so we have to keep a chance of scattered showers there. It's either the tail end of Wednesday system or the leading edge of Friday system and all eyes then turn to the weekend. So remember that three day window we will get there by about Wednesday. So if you're really trying to make your plans for Saturday and Sunday in terms of dodging rain, check in certainly by Wednesday and we'll be able to nail down more details on this one. Well, a Berkeley family says justice might not be served because Alameda County DA Pamela Price two years ago, someone killed their Two sons at a birthday party at the time the suspect was 17. Fast forward to today. That suspect is now over 18, but D.A. Price is keeping the case in juvenile court. That means the suspect could get a maximum sentence of seven years. The victim family says that simply is not enough. Our Darlin spoke with the family and advocates for the suspect. A year and a half after the shooting, emotions are still raw for the victim's family. Melanie Garcia Macias misses her cousins, Angel and JC Sotelo Garcia, every day. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm going crazy because I feel like I see them in like the crowd. Melanie was extremely close to the two boys. She says the killings tore apart the family and they'll never be the same. Christmases and Every other holiday does not feel complete. Like we try, but their absence is felt greatly. She says they're serving a life sentence of grief. The defendant has not been sentenced yet. So seven years is the max that he can get. He could get 
one or he could get none. Melanie says about 10 days ago, District Attorney Pamela Price decided to keep the suspect in the juvenile court system. The family pleaded with Price to charge the suspect as an adult. The suspect was 17 years old at the time. He's accused of killing 15-year-old Angel and 17-year-old JC at a birthday party in Oakland in October of 2022. Gunfire also injured additional teenagers. Police say the brothers were innocent victims. They were students at Berkeley High. You cannot hold someone to the same standards when they're a teenager as you would an adult. George Galvis is the executive director of Dream Beyond Bars. He's personally met the suspect. He and his staff are working to turn the young man's life around. Prisons are not the answer. The safest communities don't have the most police. They don't have the most prisons. They have the most resources. George and other Pamela Price supporters will hold a press conference on Tuesday. They want to show the public they support Price decision in this case and other cases involving minors. A different DA would at least hear us out. As for Melanie, she's urging the public to contact and pressure Price to reverse her decision. There's nothing that anybody could do to bring back Angel and JC. They can help us heal, help us feel as though there has been justice and closure for our boys. And we asked Price's office for a comment. They told us they cannot discuss cases involving minors. In San Francisco, it's been more than a week since a driver crashed into a bus stop, killing a family of four. And over the weekend, another car crashed into another bus stop. It happened on Saturday at Fulton and Park Presidio in the Richmond. You could see some damage to the passenger side fender. A person was hospitalized, but is expected to recover. The driver of the red Nissan was sighted at the scene. Police have not said but led up to that crash. Now to Oakland, where In-N-Out has officially done something it's never done before, and that is it has closed a restaurant. A fast food chain announced the decision to close in January, saying there was just too much crime to ensure the safety of its customers and employees. Our Jose Martinez was there for the final day. This Sunday marks the end of an era for In-N-Out Burger in Oakland. And it's just really sad at the fact that, you know, a big corporation like this has to shut down. Alina June is just one of many employees saying goodbye to this In-N-Out location where she has worked since 2012. This is the chain's first ever permanent closure and it comes amidst of rising concerns over crime in the area. It's just bitter. It's a real bitter moment. There's a lot of employees that gathered here today, you know, because being that Oakland is a high uh, place of crime, it has increased extremely over the years. Other businesses in the area, including a subway and a dentist, have also shuttered their doors over similar safety concerns. If you're wondering about the future of the employees, Alina tells me they were all given the chance to be transferred to other locations. She declined since she's been working from home for another company, but says she's concerned about the future of the city because... This is the main spot after games, after... But then again, that goes back to Oakland losing everybody up, you know, Raiders, the A's, like... It's just, it's just sad to see a lot of things shut down in the town. And that's why many customers lined up throughout the day to get a last bite, at least here, and to show support to those employees. Take a look at the drive through Dozens of cars ordering the iconic double-double or the 4x4 like Maria Preciado, who's been living in Oakland for over 10 years and usually comes here with her kids. She says she's very sad about the closure of In-N-Out because it's a place located in a perfect spot for Oakland and its surroundings. And it's sad to see that they're closing it because of people committing crimes here. The company announced the closure back in January, saying, despite taking repeated steps to create safer conditions, our customers and associates are regularly victimized by car break-ins, property damage, theft, and armed robberies. Mayor Shin Dao then responded, saying that she would prioritize security in this area. And you can see a police car station in the parking lot today. But a security guard who declined to be on camera told us he witnessed at least one car break-in per day. And Alina agrees. Like said, the, the whole theft thing, it just happens so quickly, you know? And it's mainly amongst, amongst this side of, of the parking lot. And then they target mainly people who come and travel with rental cars. And the closest in and out locations to Oakland are now in San Leandro and Alameda. 
As one business, though, leaves Oakland, another one pops up still ahead on CBS News Bay Area. We're going to meet the young entrepreneurs who are standing up for their hometown and focusing on the good in the town. Plus, definitely taking two math courses wasn't probably the way I wanted to do it. Algebra is returning to San Francisco schools, what it means to the eyes of students. And a drug, to help, a drug to help treat Alzheimer's was given the red light by the FDA. Why the agency is saying the drug is not ready, not just yet. I pick my brackets strategically based on statistics. And then I divide everything by the multiple of 68. Picking a winner is so random. You need a little luck. Hey, there has to be some random element. It's like blindly throwing darts. UConn. I just love how unpredictable it is every year. <laughs> mm. Yes. Oh, no, not Vern. Oh, sorry, got that. Oh. The tournament is on. Everyone OK? Play along with us tomorrow on the Morning Edition. Okay, it's day one of two without rain in it. So you can make your plans for the first part of the week anyway. It's just going to be a few clouds and temperatures which pretty much top out in the mid and upper 50s. A lot like what we've been doing temperature wise. It's not a big warm up. It's only a couple of degrees warmer than we were last week, but at least you're not going to be getting rained on today. That covers today's daytime highs. We'll say goodbye to the imagery on the virtual map and just go to some of the forecast imagery. And on that, you're going to see the approach of the next system by Wednesday. It's just clouds today and it's a bit breezy. So there's a little bit of an onshore flow today. You might notice about a 20 to 25 mile an hour breeze near the water. I'll be back with the full forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Well, as some businesses in Oakland are closing down because of crime, a new shop just opened up and the owners told us it's not just a business, but a way to showcase positive things in the town. John Ramos spoke with those young entrepreneurs. Watch as people pass by the newest store on Lakeshore Avenue. They do a double take and then turn back. What exactly is that? It looks like a store, but it could be an art gallery. It's Marche, a vintage clothing store created by 20-year-old Ty Reno Sway and Marco Verdeen, who's 24. Bringing a different type of retail, a new experience with brick and mortar and physical retail, that's like the goal. Used clothing is a popular trend among millennials, but the trick is finding just the right pieces. It's okay to be worn, even frayed, as long as it's something that expresses creativity and, more importantly, is one of a kind. 
but it really is a, is a piece of art itself and, and really like shows kind of your fashion taste and, and being different there. That's what's important and what's cool for a consumer is like you won't see this at any other store for the most part and, and it's just this one size and you hope it's your size. It's definitely an eye catcher. So these are original 501s from I believe 1968. These pants are actually from the summer of love? Most likely. <laughs> Someone's having fun with these, that's for sure. But as much as the business partners are peddling clothing, they're also trying to market their city as well. Both grew up in Oakland and are well aware of the crime that has driven so many businesses away. Directly across the street is Colonial Donut, a business that was infamously robbed three times in six months. But the guys are opening their new store here as a way to stand up for their hometown. Yeah, Oakland probably has one of the biggest hearts out. Mm -hmm. I feel like that like, defines us. Defines us, but it also shows like all the bad publicity and slander that people be like just saying about Oakland. Oakland's still here. People run with what they see on Instagram and on the news. They're like, oh, Oakland's only crime. But you, you come on a Sunday to Lake Merritt and you'll see families picnicking, people walking to the farmer's market, just a lively city that, that locals and real Oaklanders understand. And, and that's the message we want to bring to, to the bigger market and, and the rest of the Bay Area and nation in general. For young people who love the town, that's a pitch that is as appealing as the graphic tees and patched Levi's. I think there's a lot that we go through as Oakland residents and Bay Area residents. There's a lot of things that are being broadcast across the country and on the internet. Um, but, you know, we're still here and we still are living and breathing our inspirations and the things that really allow us to be a unique community. There are a lot of pressures on businesses these days, and to many, operating in Oakland is now seen as a liability. But as familiar names decide to cut and run, it only leaves opportunities for those who believe in the city to stick around and maybe even start something new. And for the first time in more than a decade, students attending public schools in San Francisco will be able to take algebra. If you live anywhere other than San Francisco, that may not seem like a big deal, but it's been a policy debate and political fight for years. But now the district has changed course and reversed its policy. Devin Feely spoke with a student and parent dealing with the fallout of that change. For fun, you don't feel like don't do math at all. But as a subject in school, you probably would have to push through that, right? Carlos Quintanilla has done the math and believes that taking algebra next year as an eighth grader will add to his chances of getting into a good college and perhaps someday help fulfill his dream of becoming a doctor. Maybe medical stuff? I don't know. Being a surgeon seems fun. Tiring, but, you know, fun. For the first time in a decade, the San Francisco Unified School District will offer algebra to eighth grade students like Carlos after reversing its policy of beginning algebra in high school and not sooner. Why are you holding our kids back? The school district's previous policy created a fair amount of division within the school community. Before the March primary, we introduce you to Rex Ridgeway and his granddaughter Josie, who took two math courses, algebra and geometry, in a single year as a freshman to accelerate her education and allow her to take calculus by the time she was a graduating senior. Definitely taking two math courses wasn't probably the way I wanted to do it. The experience turned Rex into an outspoken critic of the district's policy. The bottom line is, it didn't work. I call it a decade of damage. He even campaigned in favor of Prop G, a non-binding ballot measure that allowed San Francisco voters to weigh in on the issue. Prop G passed with overwhelming support from voters, nearly 82 percent, in favor of the school system offering algebra to eighth graders like Carlos, whose mother Angelica says it would be a welcome addition to the school's curriculum. It's important they learn algebra in an earlier age. For me, it's important. Carlos says his family is likely to opt into the algebra program next year, but he still has some nagging doubts about whether he's ready for the challenge. If I were to really want to enter algebra, I feel like the conversation would go, are you going to study or are you going to be prepared? Which would, of course, be the formula for success. And Devin says he reached out to the district about speaking to a middle school math teacher for this story, but that interview did not happen. Still ahead, the FDA is pulling back on approving a drug that was supposed to treat Alzheimer's. A Stanford doctor joins us to explain the pushback. 
And a reminder, you can stream CBS News Bay Area wherever, whenever. Catch all of our live newscasts plus news and weather updates throughout the day. Find us on the free CBS News app or on Pluto TV. Okay, with the exception of a little bit of an onshore breeze today, areas along the coast and especially here in the city, it's going to be kind of that classic onshore breeze going in through the Golden Gate. So it's like a 20 to 25 mile an hour breeze there through the afternoon and those daytime highs in the mid and upper 50s might feel a little cooler there as a result of that. But if you're not near the water, you don't notice that at all today really. It's going to be less wind and generally a much nicer day. Monday and Tuesday are just like that. And then on Wednesday, this next system gets here. So when we get back together in the complete first alert forecast, we're going to go into a lot more detail, not just on the Wednesday rain, because that's the easier one. And that's the one that we've got a lot more certainty on. We're going to get about a quarter of an inch of rain Wednesday, second half of the day. So these are not downpours. It's just more beneficial rain than anything else. It's the system after this that requires a little more analysis. That one for Friday through the weekend has some more question marks on it. And since it is a weekend, we... That's, that's a little bit more important. So it's a cutoff low. You're probably used to dealing with these a lot. We've had many of them over the course of the winter. We'll go into a lot more on that. Coming up in the full forecast again in just a few minutes. Well, the FDA is delaying on uh, the approval for the latest drug that treats the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, at least for now. Join me now to tell us why is Dr. Michael Gracious, professor of neurology and neurological sciences at Stanford Medicine. So doctor, can you first tell us how is this drug supposed to work? Right. So the notion with um, denanumab, like the previous um, drugs before it, is that uh, this is an antibody that's given as an infusion in your arm. Uh, it gets into the brain and it removes amyloid plaques from the brain. And the, the thought is that that should help uh, patients do better in terms of their memory and other cognitive functions. And so why has the FDA made this move to, to pull back on, on that approval? Yeah, it's a little hard to, to read the tea leaves. There hasn't been a lot released on exactly why they did it other than what Lilly, uh, the company, has released. So I'm a little uncertain. I, I'm hopeful that they're just keen on taking a closer look. There are a number of issues, not just with um, denanumab, the one that's being considered, but also with lecanemab, which was recently approved, um, that I think require a little more uh, attention to detail. And originally, what was the optimism surrounding this drug? Was there a lot of hope and optimism that this was this would work? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's been some contention around the approval of uh, the first 
uh, medicine in this class called aducanumab, which, you know, there was one negative study and one positive study, um, but the FDA approved it anyway. And then it wasn't covered by uh, Medicare or by insurance companies. Then came uh, lecanemab, the second drug, which has now been approved, which, um, you know, there was only one study and it was positive, but the effects uh, on patients were very kind of minimal and probably not easily detected by patients or families or physicians. And the hope with the nanomab is that the, the effect on these clinical outcome measures, the ones that we care about, was a little larger. Uh, and so the hope was that maybe this was going to be, you know, finally delivering on the promise of this, this class of medications. And you, you mentioned some of the other medications, but what are the drugs that are available now to treat Alzheimer's? How effective are they? How do they compare to this drug? Yeah, so there are a couple approved medicines that, have, that go back about 20 years or so now, which are not very effective. They help a little bit with symptoms. These we hoped would be more disease modifying, not just target the symptoms, but actually get at the pathology. And, and the truth is they do remove amyloid plaques from the brain, which is incredible uh, by itself. The problem is that they don't really have much, or in my view, really any uh, impact on the clinical measures that we care about, like memory and uh, ability to carry out activities of daily living, those sorts of things, the sort of bread and butter of, of what we'd like to see improve in our patients. And what is your hope uh, for, for the treatment of Alzheimer's? What do, you, what do you see in the next three to five years? Yeah, even though I'm not very optimistic about this particular class of medications, I think the field has learned a lot from some of these large studies that, that, that didn't work. There are other targets, and I think the field needs to come to grips with that, that amyloid isn't the only uh, protein that we can target in Alzheimer's disease. There's a trial ongoing now actually targeting a second protein called tau, which we think is really important for Alzheimer's disease. Um, APOE is another protein that I think is, is probably going to be targeted shortly. So I think we're, you know, we're getting very precise treatments uh, coming online. It's just a question of, of whether they work or not. I think the theory behind them is, is strong, but you know, we need to see the clinical outcomes that we care about. Yeah, a lot of people are hoping and wondering what, what's next for Alzheimer's treatment. So always good information. Dr. Michael Drakis, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for covering the topic. All right. Thank you, sir. Well, coming up in our next half hour in CBS News Bay Area, after more than a year of searching, Oakland finally has a new police chief. But will he be able to turn things around when it comes to crime? New chief, we welcome you to the city of Oakland. At this point, all we can do is be optimistic. And a Bay Area agency dedicated to improving the lives of young children. Now they're celebrating 25 years of service and looking ahead to the future.
Ron Yamamoto. This is a minute in Sunnyvale. Police shot and killed a man they say was armed with a knife near a mobile home park. Officers say the man charged at one of them after being told to put down his weapon when another officer shot him. The man was pronounced dead at the hospital. We're prepared to pay more to drive on the Golden Gate Bridge. The board of directors approved a toll hike plan that, that starts July 1st. Fast Track customers will pay $9.25. It will be $9.50 for pay as you go. Users, $10.25 for invoice payers. That toll will go up 50 cents every year for the next five years. Protests in San Francisco against Israel's planned ground operation in the Rafah portion of Gaza. More than a million Palestinians sheltered there. Today, the United Nations Secretary Council passed a resolution demanding a ceasefire in Gaza and the release of all hostages by Hamas. Okay, the next couple of days are pretty easy. We're waiting for the next system on Wednesday to come from a thousand miles out that way and bring us a chance of rain. We can see it here on the future cast. That system rolls in for the second half of Wednesday. This is the one we started timing out a little bit earlier in a previous visit, just to show you what this looks like. It's a few scattered showers through Wednesday afternoon and evening, maybe a quarter of an inch of rain. So not a super rainy scenario here. We're not worried about flooding or any major impacts from this one, but we got to put rain in the seven day forecast because of it. It's about a quarter of an inch of rain. The one that comes in after that on Friday has better ingredients. It's put together in a more impressive way and it's going to mean better rain most likely on Friday, maybe a half an inch of rain. It's a little too early to get too specific on this one though, because as you'll see, this system becomes a cutoff low. One of those that detaches itself from the storm track and then has nothing to motivate it to move along and it just sits out here and wanders and wobbles seemingly aimlessly. And by the time we get to the weekend, it's drifted back out off the coast and we may very well find ourselves in a break as we go into Saturday and Sunday where we're not getting rained on. But that is too close for comfort as these cutoff lows are notorious for changing the details until we get within about three days. So we're still outside the window where we can really nail these things down with much certainty. That's why the weekend forecast is one to stay on top of with us. And we're going to keep updating you as we get closer on the details. Here's one possible scenario. What's the total amount of rainfall look like from Wednesday through Saturday as we take the whole using the best long range model. It's done the best over the course of the winter with these. Adds up to about an inch in general, maybe an inch and a half in the North Bay, an inch or so southward for a four day period. That's totally manageable. So again, we're not too concerned about this. It's like a significant rain event. We're not talking about any flooding concerns, but it is going to be widespread rain and it'll certainly be good snow in the Sierra. Should this come together this way? Much more to go on this one as we get closer to it. Let's put it into the seven day forecast. Uh, Wednesday is the day where we've got the highest degree of certainty on here. That's where we pick up about a quarter of an inch of rain through the second half of the day. Thursday is the in between day, so we have to keep a chance of scattered showers there. It's either the tail end of Wednesday system or the leading edge of Friday system and all eyes then turn to the weekend. So remember that three day window we will get there by about Wednesday. So if you're really trying to make your plans for Saturday and Sunday in terms of dodging rain, check in certainly by Wednesday and we'll be able to nail down more details on this one. Well, the city of Oakland is getting a permanent police chief for the first time in more than a year. Floyd Mitchell will be tasked with leading OPD. He comes in the Bay Area from Lubbock, Texas, where he was the chief for four years. Mayor Shang Tao revealed their pick in a video statement that happened on Friday. Chief Mitchell is a strong leader and smart crime fighter who delivers results. Our Don Lynn has reaction to the announcement that ends a contentious battle over that position. The mayor says Chief Floyd Mitchell will start in late April, early May. A lot of people I talk to support him, but they say he'll face a lot of challenges. The owner and chef of Snail Bar just wants to focus on making great food. But lately, Andreas Gerardo Flores has had to hold safety meetings with staff. It is very frustrating because we're kind of living in this lawless city. He says last week, two men held up a worker. One robber put the worker in a chokehold and threatened him with a knife. Andreas says when the robbers couldn't find any money in the restaurant, they took the worker's wallet phone and backpack. Andrea says back in January, two thieves broke in and cost them thousands of dollars. The city even billed Andreas for boarding up the front door. It is a crisis and you know we are 
all suffering from it and it, it trickles down like a domino effect. Mayor Shang Tao believes Chief Mitchell will come up with strategies to reduce crime and lead the department out of federal oversight. Chief Floyd Mitchell, he's a strong leader and he's very smart on crime fighting, uh, but most importantly, he can deliver results. Chief Mitchell worked at the Kansas City Police Department for about 25 years and more recently served as a chief in Lubbock and Temple, Texas. When he was actually in Temple and Lubbock as uh, the chiefs in both of those cities, we saw that under his leadership, that overall crime did decrease and police response times did improve. Pamela Drake has been following Oakland politics for four decades. She hopes the new chief can focus more on community policing and crime prevention. I am glad this time it's an outsider. Previously, I would have said, like most people, let's pick somebody homegrown. But it sort of showed that it's really tough to be a chief of people that you were comrades with for so long. New chief, we welcome you to the city of Oakland. While Bishop Bob Jackson of Axeful Gospel Church was hoping for an internal hire, he welcomes and is ready to support the new chief. Not knowing the city, not knowing the culture, not knowing the community, not knowing the politicians either. I mean, this guy is really in for a big shock and a big surprise. Supporters like Andre say they hope this is a turning point for Oakland. At this point, all we can do is be optimistic. And yeah, Mitchell will meet with the press sometime this week to answer questions. He says he will spend his first days meeting with community members before releasing some crime-fighting strategies. The Oakland Police Officers Association had responded to the hiring, saying they are pleased the uncertainty of a chief has been resolved, and they look forward to working with Chief Mitchell. Former Police Chief Leron Armstrong, who was fighting to get his job back, said he wants everyone in the city to feel safe, and he'll do everything in his power as a private citizen to assist in that. We have more reaction to the appointment of the new chief, of police for Oakland on KPIX.com. And the San Jose Police Department has also been on the hunt for a new top cop. In the meantime, they have a placeholder. The city has elevated Assistant Chief Paul Joseph to interim chief. He will take over the department with Chief Anthony Mata steps down at the end of this month. But one California agency focused on helping kids will celebrate a big anniversary this year. For 25 years, first five California has worked to help some of the poorest children in the state. And as they mark this milestone, they are looking ahead to new ways to help. Kelsey Thord has that story. This year marks 25 years of California's first five program. Executive Director Jackie Tuhun Wong says over those 25 years, the program has helped millions of parents and young children. Absolutely so excited that we're celebrating our 25th, uh, you know, 25th anniversary, 25 years holding strong, serving, uh, you know, the youngest, you know, California's youngest residents, if you will. First Five was established in 1999 after voters approved a ballot initiative the year before that taxed tobacco products to fund services for children ages zero to five and their families. Tuhun Wong says those services include everything from prenatal care to early education. We're so proud of our investments in um, early learning, specifically that led to the, um, you know, the, the current governor actually fully funding universal TK, which is a huge win for us. To mark this big milestone, First Five will be hosting a days-long summit in Oakland this week. Speakers will include California Surgeon General, the State Treasurer, and many more officials, doctors, and educators who have been crucial to the program's success. Tu Hun Wong told me she's excited to highlight all the hard work so many people have put in over the years but she's even more excited to see this program thrive long into the future. It's been amazing that they've touched millions of lives and we are looking forward to supporting that next generation of parents, if you will. And the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission is trying to make sustainable community accessible for low-income residents. The agency is offering a $1,000 coupon toward the purchase of an electric bicycle. Our Amanda Harry has the details. Yeah. Okay. I don't ride inside if you don't mind. A new push to electrify transportation in a clean, renewable way and make it more accessible. When I got divorced, she got the car. 
79-year-old San Franciscan Graham Smithwick rides his e-bike every day. He made the switch two years ago. It's certainly economical and worth, worth the learning curve. Smithwick says it was an opportunity to see if he can live without a car. And the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission is making it more affordable with their Electrify My Ride program. It offers a $1,000 rebate to eligible customers towards the purchase of an e-bike. It's based on customers' enrollment in their low-income discount programs through Clean Power SF and Hetch Hetchy Power, in addition to the customer's utility address in an equity priority community. Smithwick says an e-bike makes individual eco-friendly transportation available to many more people. It's, it's a beautiful idea because anybody can, uh, who can ride a bike, no matter how old, no matter how young, uh, this is the way to go because you don't have to work unless you want to and you work as much as you want to. The PUC has partnered with six local bike stores for the rebate program, including the Bike Connection. Manager Nick Rawcliffe says they've had a rush of business because of the program. He says making personal transportation more affordable is changing lives. That could be the way they get to work. That could be how they get to the doctor's office or how they take their kids to school. Rawcliffe says the store is even doing what they can to bring in bikes that will be within most people's price range. As low as $10.99 right now. He says the PUC approached the store about partnering and he didn't hesitate to join. This program has been one of the very few uh, examples I can think of where a business wins, consumers win, the government's facilitated it all, and the environment wins too. The PUC launched the program on February 5th. It runs through April 20th, but they may extend or relaunch it. They've had hundreds of people interested in it. Smithwick says he hopes more people take advantage. Enjoy. It's a beautiful spring day. There's nothing like enjoying transportation. And if you're looking to buy an e-bike, there are new rules to follow in San Francisco to reduce the risk of fire, such as limiting the number of vehicles charging to four at a time, keeping charging vehicles at least three feet away from each other, and don't use any damaged or reassembled batteries. Up next, a surprising claim from the South Bay for the best sports fans in the Bay Area. You can tell my voice is cracked right now. Um, it's just a really fun environment.
Okay, it's day one of two without rain in it. So you can make your plans for the first part of the week anyway. It's just going to be a few clouds and temperatures which pretty much top out in the mid and upper 50s. A lot like what we've been doing temperature-wise. It's not a big warm-up. It's only a couple of degrees warmer than we were last week, but at least you're not going to be getting rained on today. That covers today's daytime highs. We'll say goodbye to the imagery on the virtual map and just go to some of the forecast imagery. And on that, you're going to see the approach of the next system by Wednesday. It's just clouds today. And it's a bit breezy, so there's a little bit of an onshore flow today. You might notice about a 20 to 25 mile an hour breeze near the water. I'll be back with the full forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Oh, March Madness continues and students at Stanford campus are feeling great after the women's basketball stars moved on to the Sweet 16 in the NCAA tournament for the women. And you can thank Kiki for coming in strong last week. The Cardinals needed her to bring her A game this tournament, and she did not disappoint. Last night, Stanford and Iowa State battling out at Maples Pavilion in what people are already calling an overtime classic. Kiki finished the game with a career-high 41 points. Stanford won 87-81 in overtime, and here's what Tara Vanderveer had to say after the game. Kiki Iriafin. Whoa. Uh -huh. What a great game. Kiki, uh, I just, uh, my hat's off to you, how hard you played. You're an absolute warrior. And I just, uh, I'm like, we have our own 40 point score. So um, that was an awesome, awesome um, performance. Yeah, I think I started the game off hot. And then in the second half, I kind of just remembered where we were at last year. It wasn't a great taste in our mouth. I feel like this whole season, we've had that loss last year in the back of our minds. So didn't want that to happen two years in a row. Well, next up for Stanford, the winner of NC State in Tennessee played today. And let's take a look at the March Madness Bracket Challenge right here in CBS News Bay Area. Max Darrow, Sarah Donchi tied for first with a score of 102. You can see the rest of our anchors are doing. I'm way, way, just keep going down, down the list. Uh, just head to our website, kpix.com. Look at Liz Cook, also in the hunt. Well, ever want to know what it feels like to be Steph Curry for a day? Well, these lucky kids got a chance over the weekend where Fans ages 7 to 15 got to play with the pros on Warriors ground. My daughter was very shy. She would be hiding somewhere far away. And to see her out there, like, just doing, like, in between the legs, like, dribbling. Like, I'm like, wow, she's just going for it. Just throwing the ball up with, like, no fear and making new friends. It's, it's awesome. Kids got some skills. So what's the Bay Area sports team with the most dedicated fans? You might say the Warriors, the Niners, or the A's, or even the Giants. But according to one online sports gaming website, it's the San Jose Earthquakes who beat out all but two other teams in professional sports. Arlen Ramirez reports how they measured loyalty by how often teams fill their stadiums beyond capacity. When San Jose Earthquakes fans come to a game, thousands never take a seat. And many, like Quake superfan Devin Bollet, wouldn't have it any other way. Right now we're singing about the Earthquakes. Right now it's Ale Ale, we're San Jose. The Ultras, we're just singing as loud as we can. As you can tell, my voice is cracked right now. Um, it's just a really fun environment. Devin is packed into one of PayPal Park's two built-in standing room only sections, which helps the Quakes boost attendance for most home games to well over the stadium's official capacity of 18,000. And now the sports world is taking notice. The online gaming website GamblingZone.com just ranks sports teams with the most dedicated fans based on a 10-year average attendance as compared to their home stadium capacity. The Dallas Cowboys were number one, followed by the NHL's Minnesota Wild. But the Earthquakes ranked third with an average attendance of 102.3% of stadium capacity. The 49ers came in fourth, and the Golden State Warriors were 19th based on that metric. This is crazy, George, and yes, the San Jose Earthquakes are loyal. I want crazy George was not surprised. He's been cheering on the team since their founding in 1974, and neither was the team CEO. And we have a really loyal, dedicated fan base that's been with us, like I said, for 50 years through many ups and downs, like different leagues, different teams, different team names, different logos, but they've always been there supporting us, fighting with us. Uh, 
for the good times and bad. To the man cave. Devon was practically born into being an Earthquakes fan. He has one of the largest collections of Quakes memorabilia, which fills his room. He's been following the team since his youth soccer days, and he also has his own souvenir from scoring 200 career goals in high school and hopes to one day be an Earthquakes Youth Academy coach. He also likes the Sharks and the 49ers, but the Earthquakes to him are just different. I always look forward to attending a San Jose Earthquakes game just because of the level of passion that surrounds me at a game. The Earthquakes don't have the biggest stadium or the largest fan base. Last year, they didn't even make the playoffs. But win, lose, or draw, their average attendance at home, well over stadium capacity, is something fans can stand up and shout about. Good to see Crazy George in there. Well, coming up, an old school method of finding love is making a comeback. Why some Bay Area singles are switching from dating apps to speed dating. Okay, with the exception of a little bit of an onshore breeze today, areas along the coast and especially here in the city, it's going to be kind of that classic onshore breeze going in through the Golden Gate. So it's like a 20 to 25 mile an hour breeze there through the afternoon and those daytime highs in the mid and upper 50s might feel a little cooler there as a result of that. But if you're not near the water, you don't notice that at all today really. It's going to be less wind and generally a much nicer day. Monday and Tuesday are just like that. And then on Wednesday, this next system gets here. So when we get back together in the complete first alert forecast, we're going to go into a lot more detail, not just on the Wednesday rain, because that's the easier one. And that's the one that we've got a lot more certainty on. We're going to get about a quarter of an inch of rain Wednesday, second half of the day. So these are not downpours. It's just more beneficial rain than anything else. It's the system after this that requires a little more analysis. That one for Friday through the weekend has some more question marks on it. And since it is a weekend, we... That's, that's a little bit more important. So it's a cutoff low. You're probably used to dealing with these a lot. We've had many of them over the course of the winter. We'll go into a lot more on that. Coming up in the full forecast again in just a few minutes. Well, if you're thinking about just deleting your dating apps altogether, you're certainly not alone. Swipe fatigue has set in, and as our Itai Ha shows us, that has a lot of Bay Area singles taking a page from the dating history book. Close your eyes, feel your feet on the ground in the fast-paced world of swipes and likes. 
Bonnie Rust is giving her thumbs a break and embracing a hands-on approach to dating. It's been really hard to find love. <laughs> you feel your feet on the ground. A Pilates instructor, Bonnie became a widow more than a decade ago. In the years since, she's tried dating apps with little success. It's tiresome and exhausting and makes you less hopeful and you can kind of give up. Deep breath in. But instead of giving up, she decided to give in and joined a Tantra speed dating event in San Francisco. So that's okay. Tantra speed dating aims to go beyond the usual superficial interactions. There are no candlelit tables here, but the premise is pretty much the same. Women are positioned in the inner circle, while the men stand in the outer circle. Instead of brief conversations, people engage in exercises designed to form meaningful connections. At the end of each encounter, women place a bead into the pouch the men wear around their necks if they're interested. To avoid the sting of rejection, men are asked to close their eyes during the bead ceremony. I am ready to let go of being worried. This is just one of many rapid romance events enjoying a comeback these days. According to ticket platform Eventbrite, speed dating has soared 63% compared to last year. The more that you meet people, the more comfortable you get. Deborah Oppenheim is the host and lead facilitator. She says the resurgence is a reaction to people's growing dissatisfaction with dating apps. How often have you had the experience where it's like you've got a list and this person needs to be X, Y, and Z, and then you show up in person and you're like, ooh, ah, this doesn't feel good. In the end, Bonnie hands out five beads. Thank you. And while she's not sure any of the men will turn out to be Mr. Right, she's feeling optimistic. I think this has helped me let go of the awkwardness in meeting people. Hoping to find true love by swiping left on dating apps. Well, at the end, depending on who got beads, the men and women exchange email addresses and either of them can start up the conversation. Bonnie told Itai she received a few emails but did not continue the conversation. Well, thanks for streaming CBS News Bay Area. I'm Ryan Yamamoto. We'll be right back with your first alert forecast and a look at your top stories.
Jim Amoto. This is the Minute San Francisco Police are investigating a deadly shooting at the discovery of two bodies inside a home. This was a scene on Dwight Street in the Portola District last night. No word yet on who the people are or what led up to that shooting. Boeing CEO says he's stepping down by the end of the year. The departure of Dave Calhoun comes after nearly five years in that role. Calhoun and the company are facing mounting pressure to make changes after a series of safety incidents in recent months. And Daly City Seton Hospital workers are on a two-day strike. They are calling for better health benefits amid ongoing contract negotiations. Seton Hospital says they're disappointed with the union's decision. Their priority is to provide uninterrupted care to their patients. Bay Area's only primetime newscast at 8 and 9 p.m. on the all-new PIX Plus 44 Cable 12. I'm Ryan Yamamoto. This is The Minute. Okay, the next couple of days are pretty easy. We're waiting for the next system on Wednesday to come from a thousand miles out that way and bring us a chance of rain. We can see it here on the future cast. That system rolls in for the second half of Wednesday. This is the one we started timing out a little bit earlier in a previous visit, just to show you what this looks like. It's a few scattered showers through Wednesday afternoon and evening, maybe a quarter of an inch of rain. So not a super rainy scenario here. We're not worried about flooding or any major impacts from this one, but we got to put rain in the seven day forecast because of it. It's about a quarter of an inch of rain. The one that comes in after that on Friday has better ingredients. It's put together in a more impressive way and it's going to mean better rain most likely on Friday, maybe a half an inch of rain. It's a little too early to get too specific on this one though, because as you'll see, this system becomes a cutoff low. One of those that detaches itself from the storm track and then has nothing to motivate it to move along and it just sits out here and wanders and wobbles seemingly aimlessly. And by the time we get to the weekend, it's drifted back out off the coast and we may very well find ourselves in a break as we go into Saturday and Sunday where we're not getting rained on. But that is too close for comfort as these cutoff lows are notorious for changing the details until we get within about three days. So we're still outside the window where we can really nail these things down with much certainty. That's why the weekend forecast is one to stay on top of with us. And we're going to keep updating you as we get closer on the details. Here's one possible scenario. What's the total amount of rainfall look like from Wednesday through Saturday? So we take the whole using the best long range model. It's done the best over the course of the winter with these. Adds up to about an inch in general, maybe an inch and a half in the North Bay, an inch or so southward. For a four day period, that's totally manageable. So again, we're not too concerned about this. It's like a significant rain event. We're not talking about any flooding concerns, but it is going to be widespread rain. And it'll certainly be good snow in the Sierra should this come together this way. Much more to go on this one as we get closer to it. Let's put it into the seven day forecast. Uh, Wednesday is the day where we've got the highest degree of certainty on here. That's where we pick up about a quarter of an inch of rain through the second half of the day. Thursday is the in between day, so we have to keep a chance of scattered showers there. It's either the tail end of Wednesday system or the leading edge of Friday system and all eyes then turn to the weekend. So remember that three day window we will get there by about Wednesday. So if you're really trying to make your plans for Saturday and Sunday in terms of dodging rain, check in certainly by Wednesday and we'll be able to nail down more details on this one. Well, a Berkeley family says justice might not be served because Alameda County DA Pamela Price two years ago, someone killed their Two sons at a birthday party at the time the suspect was 17. Fast forward to today. That suspect is now over 18, but D.A. Price is keeping the case in juvenile court. That means the suspect could get a maximum sentence of seven years. The victim family says that simply is not enough. Our Darlin spoke with the family and advocates for the suspect. A year and a half after the shooting, emotions are still raw for the victim's family. Melanie Garcia Macias misses her cousins, Angel and JC Sotelo Garcia, every day. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm going crazy because I feel like I see them in like the crowd. Melanie was extremely close to the two boys. She says the killings tore apart the family and they'll never be the same. Christmases and Every other holiday does not feel complete. Like we try, but their absence is felt greatly. She says they're serving a life sentence of grief. The defendant has not been sentenced yet. So seven years is the max that he can get. He could get 
one or he could get none. Melanie says about 10 days ago, District Attorney Pamela Price decided to keep the suspect in the juvenile court system. The family pleaded with Price to charge the suspect as an adult. The suspect was 17 years old at the time. He's accused of killing 15-year-old Angel and 17-year-old JC at a birthday party in Oakland in October of 2022. Gunfire also injured additional teenagers. Police say the brothers were innocent victims. They were students at Berkeley High. You can't